Hello everyone, welcome to Her Pound of Flesh, a short piece of interactive horror about heartache, made by Liz England. And as it says here, Her Pound of Flesh was made for Asylum Jam, which tasks developers with making horror games that do not use mental illness or asylums as part of the setting or gameplay mechanics. This game was made in around 48 hours. So there's a link to the Asylum Jam website right there, but of course I will also have that in the description along with a link to where you can play this game for yourself. And I've actually played another game by Liz England called Isis. That's another piece of interactive horror, and it was really, really good. So I'm looking forward to this. I learned about this game from a site called Free Indie Games. Link to that will be in the description. And it's a really excellent resource for finding out about games you might otherwise miss. So I recommend checking that out. Also, this game does not include any sound. So what you're hearing right now is something that I've added. I've added creepy background music to heighten the sense of dread. This track is Aftermath by Kevin McLeod, a person who makes awesome music anyone can use under a Creative Commons attribution license. More info about the song and a link to Kevin McLeod's site will be at the end of the video and in the description. Okay, shall we get going? Press this restart button here. Okay, here we go. Day one. She's dead. You remind yourself that every day since she died, but her scent still lingers in the carpets, the blankets, the very walls of your apartment. Her clothes lie scattered on the floor, reminding you. No matter how far you run, you can't seem to escape her. Maybe you don't want to. Today will be different, you tell yourself. Today will be different. You close the door behind you and lock it, sealing yourself inside of your apartment. The blinds stand closed against the sunlight. Clothing, mail, and random artifacts of your life litter every surface. Fruit flies dance around the sink in the kitchen. Your phone screeches and buzzes in the quiet apartment. Answer your phone or ignore it. Let's see. Let's answer it. You put the phone to your ear and sit down on the sagging couch. Hey, 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 the caller says. You recognize the voice. How you doing? You make a non-committal noise. So, buddy, you told me you'd have something for me today. I've got a couple buyers that are very interested. His excitement grates your ears. You got what I'm looking for yet? Tell him you might have something, or lie and tell him you have nothing. Let's tell him that we have something. Yeah, I might have something, you tell him. Your voice is dry and scratchy. You pause for a moment, contemplating your own plans for the night. But there were some problems. It might not be a viable specimen. Is that right? Look, I'll call you back if it pans out, but give me a couple days, okay? You cancel the phone call before you make any mistakes and give away your lies. Remove the specimen from your pocket. You pull out a single test vial with the words Prime CU Tech printed around the seal. It shines even in the dim light. A small pink blob sits in the clear liquid. The culture floats as you tip the vial. So much work for such a little thing. It has potential, but it's not ready yet. There's still something else you need. Search the bathroom for it, or search the bedroom for it. Let's search the bedroom. You go into the bedroom. Her clothes still sit where she last left them, laying about the carpeted floor and hanging over the chair. Dust has started to gather in a thin layer over them. You will be able to find what you need here. Search the hamper for it, or search the floor for it. Let's search the hamper. You check the hamper. It's piled halfway with her unwashed clothes, still waiting for her to return to them. You can smell her in them, her sweat, her perfume, her stink. You take a pair of her old underwear. It should be enough. Take the vial and underwear into the spare bedroom. The spare bedroom is tiny, 
made even smaller by the boxes on the floor stacked shoulder height. They all say her name on them like a silent chorus. A table stands cluttered with metal and glass instruments. They all have Property of Prime CU Tech emblazoned on them. A large machine sits on the left, square with a thick metal door and several dials for temperature and humidity. Sit down and begin. You sit down. You pull out a petri dish and blow the dust off of it. You take out the vial and break the seal with a satisfying crack. With a pair of long tweezers, you pull the small pink piece of flesh from the solution and place it on the dish. You place it under the microscope. They are active and lively. Add a piece of her soiled underwear. You place the underwear on the desk and take up a pair of scissors. You carefully cut out the crotch where the fabric is stiffer and stained with bodily fluids. You carve out a piece the size of a dime. You place it in the petri dish and mix it with the culture. Place the active culture in the incubator. You place everything in the incubator and swing the large metal door shut. You turn the handle to seal the specimen in. The temperature and humidity inside the machine rises. There's no way of telling when the process will be complete. There's not much else to do now. You lean back and close your eyes, thinking of her. Tomorrow, you will know more. Day two. She's everywhere, even in your dreams. You look out from your childhood home and see her walking towards you, dead-eyed like her corpse on the coroner's table. She reaches out her arm. You shut the door. You can hear her outside, shuffling and thumping against the door. Brace the door against her. You wake up in a chilled sweat, aware of every inch of your skin. Your palms are clammy. It takes you a few minutes to figure out where the sounds are coming from. They are coming from the incubator. Open the incubator or listen to it. Let's listen to it. You press your ear up against the warm steel. You hear nothing for a moment. You almost give up and then it starts again. A thud against the hollow interior of the incubator, followed by a shuffling noise, as though whatever lay inside were testing the boundaries of her prison. Open the incubator. You open the incubator. You hear the hiss as the seal lifts. You feel the warm, sticky air as it hits your skin with a familiar smell. You close your eyes to bask in her scent for a moment. Open your eyes. You see a small, round lump of flesh, the size of a football. Her skin is pink and soft, like a babe's. Soft brown hairs, sparse and thin like hairs on your arm, grow in patches along the side and top of the flesh. She shudders as the cold air in the room invades her space in the incubator. You reach out hesitantly. Stroke her hair or touch her skin. Stroke her hair. You stroke her hair softly, letting your fingertips brush along the fine filaments. You rub your hand against the roots, feeling them tug and spring as your hand moves across the lump of flesh. It feels all wrong. Smooth her hair out or touch her skin. Smooth her hair out. You smooth out her hair. You wish you had a brush but the one she left behind was large and heavy, too harsh on such soft flesh. Your fingers shake. Touch her skin or calm your nerves. Touch her skin. You touch her skin. It's soft like a baby, so soft and smooth, a babe newly born. You take your hands together to lift her gently and rotate her onto her side. Is it her side? You are careful not to bruise her newly formed flesh. Dry flakes of skin fall to the floor of the incubator. Soften her skin with lotion or disinfect her skin with alcohol. 
Let's soften her skin with lotion. You head to the bathroom and open the medicine cabinet. Shaving creams and perfumes and makeup and hand sanitizer and tweezers and everything she had before she left you. You kept it all. Her lotion is in here. You squeeze some into your hand. You can smell the artificial aloe and lavender. It's how she smelled after a hot shower as she climbed into bed with you. You return to the spare bedroom with the lotion. Moisturize her with the lotion or use the lotion on your own skin. Let's moisturize her. You moisturize her carefully, massaging the lotion into her skin. There are no bones, no cartilage, nothing hard, no crevices. She's a blank canvas painted now by you and her scent. Smell her and remember, or place her back in the incubator. Let's place her back in the incubator. She needs more time to grow. You close the incubator door and lose sight of her. You place your hand on the steel door for a few moments. You'll have to just wait until tomorrow to find out. Day 3. You wake up in your bed, your clothes wrinkled and smelling of sweat and anxiety. Your stomach rumbles. Go to the spare bedroom and check on her, or get something to eat first. Let's go get something to eat. Let's give her a little bit more time to grow. You avoid the spare bedroom and go into the living room. It is dark and musty. The brown carpet hides months of stains. On the kitchen table lies some leftovers from earlier this week. You pick at them absent-mindedly, shoving bite-sized blocks of vegetable soy meat replacement products into your mouth. It does not settle your stomach. Go to the spare bedroom and check on her. You enter the spare bedroom. The incubator door is closed. You don't hear anything. You open it, releasing the seal. Her flesh spills out in a wave of pink dotted with patches of thick, curly brown hair. Her skin is red where it had pressed itself against the door of the incubator. She touches the sides of the incubator in all directions, pressing and growing into the metal, molded by it. Do not help her or pull her out of the incubator. Let's pull her out. Yeah, let's pull her out. You slip your fingers into the corners of the incubator, between the steel wall and the warm, pulsing flesh. You sense a heartbeat. You squeeze and pull. You can feel lumps under the skin, where bone and cartilage seem to be forming. The skin is thicker than it was yesterday. The blob of flesh slowly exits the incubator into your outstretched arms. Hold her in your arms, or place her on the floor. Let's hold her in my arms. You cradle her in your arms and absent-mindedly stroke her hair, now thicker and coarser than yesterday. You feel the bony protrusions under her malleable flesh and wonder which will turn into hands and, eventually, fingers. You wish you could hold her hand again. You look back at the incubator. Can't put you back in there. You cast your eyes around the room. Place her in the bathtub, or pull a trunk out from the closet. Let's place her in the bathtub. You carry her to the bathroom and use your elbow to pull apart the shower curtain to display a large, deep tub stained yellow and gray with dirt. Dark black and brown mold grows in the grout along the edge of the tub. You lean down and place her on the floor of the tub. As you move, you can feel her wiggle and undulate against you. You look down at her. Pull the shower curtain closed, or sit down and watch her. Let's watch her. You sit down and lean on your elbows, watching her within a large trunk. Her white flesh clashes with the black leather. Wait a minute, did... Oh no, I think this is actually an error. Now it's saying she's in the trunk. I think it accidentally took me over to the other story if I if I didn't put her in the bathtub. Uh-oh, it's okay though. Just just roll with it. We we put her into the into the trunk. 
You sit down and lean on your elbows, watching her within the large trunk. Her white flesh clashes with the black leather. Her skin ripples every once in a while with a shiver, but the rest of the time she moves slowly, her flesh undulating in soft calm waves of flesh. You wonder where her lungs are hiding, or if she even has any yet. Hours pass. Your arms feel stiff. You peel your hands from your face, leaving clamming red marks behind them. Tomorrow. Maybe it will be tomorrow. Day four. You wake up again, this time to a knock on your front door. You check the time. It's afternoon. You wait, huddled under your blanket, for the knocks to stop. You hear them again, and then wait. The feet shuffle again and then turn, growing fainted with each step. You recall you left her in the bathtub. Check on her in the bathtub. You crawl out of bed and straight your shirt as you head into the bathroom and flick on the light. Your eyes hover over the bathtub. A short, thick tendril of rose-colored flesh pokes out of the side of the bathtub, peering over it, searching, feeling. You recognize a misshapen fingernail at the end. It attaches to her mound like a fin. She's larger now, maybe the size of a dog. Her body has developed some form to her shapeless mass. You can see bones stretched against her skin like knots. Her hair grows in patches of thick fur. Lean down and pet her, or use the bathtub to wash her. Let's wash her. You reach for the shower knobs and fiddle with them until the chlorinated water pours through the rusty building pipes and through the tap. You test the water. It burns your hands. You welcome the red marks from the scalding temperature. Wash her in the scalding hot water, or change the water temperature and wash her. Let's change it first, and then wash her. You flip the cold water on and wait until it feels warm and soothing on your skin. You spray her with the shower head. You see her fin wriggle as you cover her bulbous flesh with water cascading across her rosy skin and patch of thick curly hair growing in tufts like weeds. Clean her with soap or clean her with bleach? Let's clean her with soap. You pick up the soap from the side of the bathtub and wet it under the water. The lavender scent fills the warm, humid room. It's her scent. You lather up the soap and then soothingly rub it into her skin and hair. She has no eyes for the suds to sting. Not yet, anyway. Soon. You spray her with the water before shutting it off. Leave her alone for the rest of the day, or dry her off with a towel. Let's dry her off. You dry her off with a large cotton towel, the only clean one you have left. You lift her in your arms as you pat her dry. She feels warm to your touch. Her hair damp, but soft. You lean down to smell her, filling your nose with her beautiful scent. You dry off the tub with a second towel best you can before placing her back inside. Leave her alone for the rest of the day. You decide to just leave her there. Her fin-like hand taps against the side of the bathtub. You can barely recognize her anymore. Maybe tomorrow it will be better. Day 5. You wake up, but you don't feel like you've slept at all. You can taste bile and scum in your mouth. You smell a stale sweat. You sit up from the couch and rub your sore neck. You haven't been to work in days. Do they even notice? Check on her in the bathtub. You stumble into the bathroom, rubbing your bleary eyes and look in on her. Her flesh has parted at the very top facing upward, two thick pink lips opening and closing and pursing themselves together. A tongue dances, snake-like, along the edge of her mouth then disappears back into the orifice. 
watch from a distance, or touch her mouth. Let's watch her. You watch her closely as you move toward the toilet and sit upon the closed lid. Her body twists as though it heard you, her mouth open and facing your direction, and her lips smacking loudly. You see deep pink and purple gums, but no teeth. Her fin thumbs along the side of the tub and then crawls over it, longer than it was yesterday. She does not appear to have the strength to move herself yet. Touch her mouth, or give her something to drink. Let's give her something to drink. You peer into her mouth and realize her tongue is dry. Her lips have begun to crack. You try to decide what to give her. Give her whiskey from the kitchen, give her water from the tap, or get fresh filtered water for her. Let's give her fresh filtered water. You go into the kitchen and open the refrigerator. It's full of old leftovers, unidentifiable food stains, and mold growing healthily on the bottom shelf. You grab a sealed bottle of water and bring it back to the bathroom. The seal crackles as you unscrew the top and start to feed the cool water to her begging mouth. Her misshapen tongue licks the final drops of water from off her lips. Give her something to eat. You leave her there alone in the bathtub and walk out into the dusky kitchen. Black shiny flies hover over the garbage can defensively. You ignore them. The refrigerator hums. The pantry is mostly empty except for a bag of rice and some seasoning packs. Let's look in the fridge. We can either cook the rice for her or look in the fridge for food. Let's look in the fridge for food. You open the fridge. The shelves are mostly empty or stained with unidentifiable liquids. A styrofoam box contains leftovers from last week. Noodles covered in spicy sauce and mold. Feed her the moldy leftovers or cook the rice for her. Let's cook the rice. You pull out your only clean pan and toss fistfuls of rice in it before filling it with water, not bothering to measure it. You place the pot on the stove, turn up the heat, and wait. The rice will incubate in there, grow, becoming soft. Hopefully. You were never much of a cook. Your stomach rumbles, but you ignore it. The rice is for her. The timer on the oven beeps after 20 minutes. Feed her the rice. You feed her the freshly cooked rice with your fingers. She eats it up greedily. Your skin crawls at the feel of her tongue against your fingertips as she searches for more. Tell her you miss her, or remind her of you. Let's tell her... Tell her you miss her. I miss you. Your voice is unsteady and little more than a whisper, but you see her lips twist. I wish you could come back to me. You hold her fin in your hand. I... You find yourself speechless as you gaze into her open maw. There's still a chance tomorrow that it will get better. Day 6. You lay in bed, wide awake, listening. Thump. The sound is coming from the closed bathroom door. Thump. Thump. She's knocking. You know that you need to decide what to do about her once and for all. You'll need to decide soon. Remain in bed, or look at the bathroom door. Remain in bed. You sink further into your blankets and refuse to look towards the door. What does she want? What do you want? What am I going to do? You ask yourself in a whisper, facing the ceiling with a blank stare. You jump as your phone screams like a siren in the empty apartment. Answer your phone or ignore it. Answer the phone. 
you close your eyes and answer the phone. Hey, 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 the familiar voice says to you. Thump. You make a noise. You got what I'm looking for? I've got a buyer here that's, well, let's just say she ain't all that happy right now. You pause, realizing this could end it all, if you, choose, if you chose to. You hear her knock on the door again and wince. You just couldn't do that to her. No. Never. Or could you? Tell him you have what he's looking for? Or tell him you have nothing he wants? Tell him you have nothing he wants. I... You hesitate. This is your opportunity to take the easy way out. Thump. No. She deserves better than that. I got nothing, man. I was fired. No more access. You'll have to find a different supplier. The phone on the other end goes silent for a long time. It was nice working with you while it lasted. The phone disconnects. Think about your options. You sit up in bed and rub your temples. You love her. You miss her. You can smell her and now you can touch her soft skin and move your fingers through her curly hair like you always did. Thump. You curl up in the fetal position. It's not quite right. You don't know what went wrong. You love her too much to hurt her? Or you fear what she is and what she will become? You love her too much to hurt her. You rub the tears out of your eyes. She is not what you wanted, but it's still her. You've brought her back. You need to do right by her. It is time. You swing your legs over the side of the bed. Open the door to the bathroom. The door swings open with her weight. She spills out into the room, a large torso of loose, squishy flesh, with half a dozen unidentifiable appendages sprouting from her body. A long mane of black curly hair goes from just above her wide open mouth along her back and trails along behind her. Her body squishes itself as she moves forward like a snail. You hear the release of suction on the bathroom tiles as she moves onto the carpet. Kneel down and hold her in your arms, or attempt to put her out of her misery. Kneel down and hold her in your arms. You drop to your knees and hold her in your arms. Her tendril wraps itself around you. You cry into her hair as you stroke it. You can feel her breath on your arm and the clink of her teeth. It's still her. Parts of her, anyway. Promise her you will never let her go, or take her someplace safe, far away. Promise her you will never let her go. You tighten your grip around her and kiss her on a hairless patch of skin. Don't worry, I won't ever let you go. You cast your eyes about the room and see it. You grab the hem of her favorite dress, pull it off the hanger, and drape it over her soft mounds of flesh. I will take care of you, you promise her. Forever. Day 31. You wake up to a knock on the front door. You groan and shut out the noise until you're fully awake. The knocking continues. It is the landlord again. You ignore it. You roll off the couch and go to the kitchen, grabbing a large pail on your way. You open up the fridge and upend a pot of noodles into the pail, filling it halfway. You reach in and continue to grab food, condiments, new or old, dumping them into the pail. Your fridge is almost as empty as your bank account. Deliver the pail of food products to her. You lug the messy pail of food to bedroom to the bedroom and open the door. You see a pile of flesh pressed up pressed up against the doorframe, completely filling the room. 
a tendril takes the pail and lifts it to the giant, gaping maw. She slurps up the food, hungrily. You use a stained towel to clean the drippings from her flesh. She puckers her lips. That's all I have, you whisper to her. You can hear the wall creak as she strains against it, growing before your eyes. Do you hear me? The banging on the door increases. You know the rules. No pets allowed. <laughs> and that is one of the endings. No pets allowed. <laughs> Shall I try some other endings? Let's do it. I'll be right back. Okay, let's try for a different ending. So let's play again from the beginning of day six. Alright, this is where she's knocking on the door. Remain in bed or look at the bathroom door. Let's remain in bed. Let's go back to the phone call. So we're going to answer the phone. But this time, instead of telling him you have nothing he wants, I'm going to tell him you have what he's looking for. I... You hesitate. This is the wrong way to do this. Thump. I have what you need. Get over here ASAP and you can have it. Right on, buddy. You hear the phone disconnect. You look toward the bathroom door and start to cry. You know that months from now, you'll regret taking the easy way out. Day 92. You've tried to put her out of your mind. You stroll the local market and use the vendors hawking new wares to distract you from her memories. At least, you used to. Now you go to the market to remember her. You pass by... You pass by the food vendors grilling squash and freshly caught fish and mass-produced imitation beef. You stop before a newer stall with perfectly cubed meat grown at the local labs. The juicy pink flesh sizzles over the hot grill. You close your eyes, inhale deeply, and continue walking. You can smell her, hot and heavy in the air. Just $7.99 per pound of flesh, the vendor shouts as you pass. <laughs> oh my god. Well, we know what his research was used for, don't we? Let's try a different ending, shall we? Play again from the beginning of day six. This time we're going to do the same thing we did before, but we're not going to keep her here. So we're going to remain in bed, answer the phone. We have nothing you want. Think about your options. Deliver too much to hurt her. Open the door. Hold her. All right. Instead of promising her you will never let her go, we're going to take her someplace safe, far away. You brush your fingers through her mane of curly black hair. I can't keep you here, love. You whisper to her, but I promise I'll keep you safe as long as I can. You stand up and go into the spare bedroom. You take the largest box you can reach, her name blazoned on the side with black marker. You empty the box and bring it into the bedroom. Don't worry, you tell her as you lift her contorted body and place it inside the box. I'll visit for as long as I can. Day 44. When the train stops, you push your way through the crowded subway and take a lonely staircase. The newsstand headlines blare new terrors. How will she lose the baby weight? screams one. Hunt for missing school kids underway, sounds another. You head, you head out into the rain, hugging the grocery bags close to you. No one is on this street, not this late at night. You walk along the sidewalk, your hood obscuring part of your face. After about a mile, you stop and look around you to make sure you are alone. Open the manhole in the alleyway. You drop the bags and pull a hidden crowbar from within your coat. You pull the manhole cover off and begin your descent. You smell the sickly sweet lavender fragrance mixed with wet trash as you reach the landing. Colorful clothes stained by water and runoff. Children's shoes and backpacks lie scattered on the concrete. Sst! 
you whisper into the darkness. Tendrils covered in pink flesh and fingernails snake forward out of the darkness, followed by a large shuffling blob of flesh that filled the entire diameter of the sewer. They take the grocery bags and tear them apart, dragging food back into the darkness. I'll bring you more, soon. The tendrils tug at your shirt, insistently. I won't let you go hungry again. <laughs> okay, that is three of the five endings. What else could I do? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Play again from the beginning of day six. Remain in bed. Ignore it. Okay, this is different. You ignore the phone. You let it ring out without even checking the caller. But you are pretty sure you know who it is. Thump. It goes to voicemail. Check the voicemail or delete it. Let's delete it. You delete the voicemail without looking at it. You know who it is and what he wants. There's no way you would do that to her. Thump. But what are you going to do with her? Think about your options. Okay, you love her too much to hurt her, or you fear what she is and what she will become. All right, this is what we're gonna try now. You fear what she is and what she will become. Thump. You shiver under your blankets, wondering what kind of creature she's become now and what she'll be tomorrow or next week or next month. You swing your legs over the side of the bed and stand up. Search for a weapon or open the door to the bathroom. Let's search for a weapon. You walk into the kitchen. Your fingers tremble as they wrap around a large knife. You walk back to the bathroom door and look down at the floor. A pair of tendrils covered in pink flesh and tufts of fur snake back and forth under the opening. Open the door to the bathroom. The door swings open with her weight. She spills out into the room. A large torso of loose, squishy flesh with half a dozen unidentifiable appendages sprouting from her body. A long mane of black, curly hair goes from just above her wide open mouth along her back and trails along behind her. Her body squishes itself as she moves forward like a snail. You hear the release of suction on the bathroom tiles as she moves onto the carpet. Kneel down and hold her in your arms or attempt to put her out of her misery. Let's attempt to put her out of her misery. You hesitate for a moment and remind yourself of what she has become. You swing the knife with all of your force down upon her mass, aiming for her center in the hopes that the tip would find her brain. She screams noiselessly and whips her tendrils and appendages, grabbing at you. You feel her teeth tear at your flesh. Your arm bleeds. You stab her again and again and again. She stops moving. You collapse on top of her, burying your face in her thick, curly hair. You can only hope you can forgive yourself for this, one day, eventually. Day 11. You absentmindedly scratch your arm where you removed the thick, bloodstained gauze. It healed up surprisingly flat, fast. You can still see the marks from her teeth where they pierced the flesh. The soft, pale flesh. Check the wound tomorrow for infection. Day 12. Your arm itches maddenly. You scratch at it, turning it red, but there's no signs of infection. There's signs of something else instead. You play with the soft, dark, curly hairs that have sprouted in bunches along your inner wrist. Your palm itches. There's nothing you can do now except hope that the itching stops. Check your arm again tomorrow. Day 11. Your arm is splotchy, with patches of pale pink flesh, dotting it all the way to your shoulder in deep contrast to your normal skin tone. You run your fingers through a tuft of black hair that has formed over a new lump on your wrist. Your palm itches. You scratch at it and take a pair of pliers to the fingernail growing in there, but you can't get a good grip on it. 
You lift your palm to your face and inhale deeply. You can smell her inside you. You smile. I guess we'll be together forever. <laughs> so there is four of the five endings. How you get the fifth one, I'm not sure, but I'm going to leave it there. That was really, really, really good. The only problem I had it I had with it was just some the occasional uh, misspell and the little section where it seemed to mess up where it, it thought like it took me to the section where I put her in the trunk even though I selected the bathtub. But then afterwards I went back to the bathtub, so it wasn't even that big of a deal. So there's a couple small errors, but that that's it. Other than that, it was amazing. So creepy. Dear God. I like this even more than Isis. And I really liked Isis, but this is on a whole new level of creepy. God, that was good. <laughs> Ugh. It wasn't joking about this. Content warning. Body horror. The descriptions of... The flesh and the... Like the perversion of the human form. All the descriptions of her growing, this eyeless, tendrily, hairy blob moving like a snail. Oh my god. It was incredibly well written. Very effective. The descriptions for everything, just, just the way it was written and how it described what was happening just made my skin crawl. Ugh. Yeah, that was, that was really, really good. Okay, well, I guess I will leave it there. I'm not gonna forget that anytime soon. Maybe I'll have wonderful dreams about it tonight. <laughs> Ugh, I hope not. Hmm. Okay, well, I hope, I hope everyone enjoyed my playthrough of Her Pound of Flesh.